strong relationship between science and society is very important, as the pandemic has reminded us all very fierce, forcefully. And in order to achieve that, we need to work on multiple fronts. For example, today, in numerous occasions, we have pointed out the importance of having representative data or the importance of using algorithms that don't enforce discrimination or disparities. What I want to focus with you today is one other aspect that is communication. We cannot trust each other if we cannot understand each other. So what I would like to do is to share some principles that I have found useful in my career as a data scientist to facilitate effective communication of our findings to the public. One, we should pay attention to the question and resist the temptation to use whatever data science method we have that is handy. If there is a discrepancy between the results that we get and the question that was actually asked, there's going to be the communication difficulties. Another thing that it's important to remind ourselves is that we have to be clear. But clarity does not mean oversimplifying things. Whenever we reduce the complexity, we ignore it, we run into the dangers of unintended consequences. Words do matter. So we have to be careful not to assign names to things that do not exist, that are not important. They are just a byproduct of our analysis, not for public consumption. And finally, even if we hack all the time in all the tasks that we try to do in life, when we are professional, we have to put on our hats of data scientists and really be scientists and therefore communicate clearly and in an intelligible manner what are the limitations of our analysis and their certainties. So to illustrate why I came to these principles and how they have helped me, I want to share with you some vignettes from my day job, which is analyzing genetic data. So this picture from Rosalind Franklin helped us understand that DNA is a long polymer formed of four bases, and we share most of the bases. But there are some positions in which we have variation, and this variation impacts the way we look, how tall we are, and the chances we have to develop some diseases. So people in my area collect information on millions of these positions in the genomes when we have some variation in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals on whom we also have phenotypic information. And we try to understand which position in the genome carry information for this phenotype. We do this for two reasons. Once, if we point to positions in the genome, it's equivalent to pointing to biological pathway. This will increase our understanding. It will give us some drug targets. Also, we want to use this information for counseling and for developing personalized risk scores for individuals. Now, this trove of data is analyzed in this, in this way that I'm going to try to describe to you in a fairly cartoonish aspect. So I'm not going to account for you of the rich literature in genome-wide association studies, but what I'm going to describe is a well-established and very popular pathway. So even if we have collected data on millions of SNPs, we analyze the association between the phenotype and these genetic variants one at a time with very simple linear models. And we say that we have a discovery whenever we discover that one of these genetic variants is associated to the phenotype. We can reject the hypothesis of independence. Controllings, why do we do this? We do this because it's easy because doing these bivariate models, it's easy to handle missing data, and these bivariate models produce for us p-values, which we think are important, and indeed they are, to ensure reproducibility of our findings. But there are some challenges that come with this simplified analysis, especially when we try to put the results together for prediction. So the picture that you see here, it's one that is often used to convey the results of the analysis. Each dot here represents a different genetic variant. On the x-axis, you have positions along the genome with the color code change, uh, indicating the changes of chromosomes. And on the y-axis, you have strength of association measured in terms of uh, minus log p-values. You can see that there is a bunch of green dots, and those correspond to those SNPs for which we have rejected the hypothesis of independence from the phenotypes but also all the SNPs that are very correlated to them, indistinguishable. 
And you can see there is a lot of these green points, and the signal that we have is spread along all of these green points, and there are some difficulty in interpretations here. For example, I cannot even tell how many independent locations in the genome have something to do with schizophrenia, which is the trait analyzed in the previous slides. We cannot even say what portion of the genome overall is important for schizophrenia. It's very hard to do genetic counseling because at the level of the population, it's fine to see, oh, there is an association between this SNP and schizophrenia. But unless I know exactly which allele is truly important, this is not very useful for an individual to know. And this working with association by, um, guilty by association, makes it very difficult to transport our finding across different human populations, because different human populations have different distribution for all of these genetic variants. We have learned very little about disease mechanism with this bivariate method of analysis. And we are really not in a very good place for doing prediction. And in fact, the prediction methods that have been developed, starting from this approach, have shown to be very not robust across human populations. So what can we do? You can see that these are all difficulties that emerge from the fact that there is, a, there is a mismatch between really the question that we try to answer and the tool we use. Um, I have been fortunate to be associated with a number of people that have tried to improve a little bit the situation, uh, following, um, inspired by the principle I tried to share. And one first step is try to test hypotheses that are more to the point. So for example, instead of looking simply for variants that are associated with the disease, we go ahead and look for variants that have information to tell us about the disease on top of every other variant in the genome. If we make such discoveries, these discoveries are by definition not repetitive because every single one that I can point us has some additional information. They are good input for prediction algorithm because they have something to tell me. And they do bring us closer to um, understanding the biological mechanism behind these traits. So this is uh, how our result might be presented. And the very top panel you see, it's an echo of the same type of displays that I have shown you before. And the middle panel would represent how our analysis uh, is, can be visualized. Again, on the x-axis, you have positions in the genome. On the y-axis, you don't have strength of association, but precision of findings. So at the very bottom, you have the more coarse finding, the ones with lower resolution. And as you move upward towards the panel, and it's probably easier if you look at the very bottom that it's a zoom up version of uh, one segment. As we move up, we increase the resolution. So you can see that instead of dots, I represent my finding here with boxes, and only the boxes that are significant, that are correspond to discovery, are represented. The width of the box, the uh, basis of the box, represent the genomic area, where I can say that there is a variant that influences the phenotype in addition to what happens in the rest of the genome. So every box, it's an independent discovery, something that has to tell me additional information on the trait. And as we move up on these building blocks, you can see that the size of the boxes diminishes, and that corresponds to increased resolution. Can I pinpoint more precisely where these variant is? are? And in some cases, I can. In some cases, I cannot. Another aspect that it's true about genetic data and that I have tried to um, hint about is that we see a variation of distribution of these genetic variants across human populations. So um, if we work in the domain of guilty by association, what happens is that one variant might be proxy for the causal variable in one population, might, might not be in the next population. So what I have to do is try to focus on variants that are good proxies across different populations. This, it's dictated by reasons of fairness, but it's also useful from an understanding viewpoint. If I detect an association that it's invariant across environment, across population, it's much more likely that this association is actually causal, that it's not simply picking up the effect of something else going on, but it's pointing directly to the effect. 
And so we have devised method to capitalize on data in multiple populations when these are available and find specifically these associations that are consistent. So if we go back to our picture of building blocks, the top image represents the same that I have shown you before. Um, and as we move down the panel, you can see how our discoveries can be refined and diminish in number when we insist that they are fine not just in one population, but two, this would be the yellow graph, three, this would be the blue graph, or four, the green graph. Finally, I want to um, bring attention to an, the aspect of conveying uncertainty. That's really what we need to do as scientists. And Nowadays, whenever we do prediction, we use very complicated algorithms, and it's very difficult to actually give a nice um, description of their level of uncertainty. The way to do it is certainly to construct predicted intervals, so not just return to our user a prediction, but say this is actually the range within which, with 90% probability, the actual value that you'll get to observe will be. Now, constructing that range is difficult for the type of sophisticated algorithms that we use nowadays. We cannot fall back on parametric models. But there are solutions that are available to us, and um, the person represented here is uh, Vladimir Volk, who, unlike the other um, that appear on my slides, is not a collaborator of mine, but I want to acknowledge his work because he introduced the field of conformal inference, which really allows us to do th this uncertainty quantification in a way that it's clear for the user and very powerful because it doesn't require any specific assumption. And Vladimir Vovko is also from Ukraine, uh, who is having a hard time right now, so Slava Ukraina for today. Now, uh, what we have worked on is um, an enlargement of these methods that point that focus on the problem of providing good prediction intervals that are valid for every group of the population. If you are not intentional about this, what it might happen is that you create a prediction interval that is valid for the majority, but it actually does not cover the outcome for minority populations. And this might lead actually to wrong information and might lead users to make decisions that are not what they would intend to make. Um, so we have worked um, on this one and we intend to apply this method also for genetic prediction. So I hope these examples um, illustrate a little bit more concretely uh, the meaning besides this principle, um, or what these principles meant for me and how I came uh, to find them useful. So reiterating them once again, we need to develop methods, if they are not available yet, that really answer the questions of interest. We don't want to have a discovery that is not really what our user is interested in, because the user is going to reinterpret our findings. And then maybe all of those reproducibility guarantees or statistical properties that we thought were associated with our discoveries fail, because in fact, they are using it differently. Uh, the, Polygenic risk scores that are the way that we use to combine uh, informations on the genome are really nowadays not very ready for prime time. They are useful to convey for scientists, for ourselves, a sense of what the information is that we have from this individual about the disease, but they're not very good for prediction. If we construct the prediction intervals, they are going to be very huge. So let's not emphasize unduly their role. Um, and then let's try to be a scientist. I have 33 more seconds, the clock tells me, so I'm going to put here um, this final slide, um, inviting you to um, yet another conference on the data science space that we will have here um, in just about a month. Um, it will not be so wonderfully organized and uh, it will not exist um, on the... Um, online platform in such an interactive fashion, but we will be here and we will be streaming what's happening. We will be very happy to see you all here. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>